Hello and uh, welcome to Science with Dr. J. This is a series of 40 episodes uh, to talk about science and about our universe, which we are part of and it's part of us, so that we can understand more about nature and how the natural world works. The first uh, episode, today's episode, is uh, a universe full of surprises. And in fact, there are lots of interesting and amazing surprises and we'll talk about them. But um, um, just want to tell you how I started my journey in, in, in science. When I was a child, before I went to school, I used to really love uh, fairy tales. I used to read them and listen to them. I, I, I enjoyed them tremendously. And of course, fairy tales, you know, big flying animals and heroes and villains and weird trees with arms that move. But um, the most fun part was the magic part, where you can just do, like, go like this and things happen. I, I enjoyed that. One of the things I really wanted to get was an Aladdin lamp. I just thought that would have, that would have been an amazing thing to have. And I also wanted an, an invisibility cloak. You know, you, you wear it and then you become invisible. I was so fascinated, I thought that would be amazing. Anyway, those are fairy tales, and of course we know that uh, they're, they're myths and they're not true, but for a child, they can't tell the difference between what's true and what's mythical. They have to be told. And um, a lot of things seemed uh, mixed in those young, young days. But of course I grew up, went to school, but school, you know, although I was hoping it would be a lot more interesting and I'll discover amazing things, it was actually boring. Not only boring, it was stressful. Because in school, they, the teachers just give you facts to remember and spill, spill it back to the exam, in exam time. I didn't like that. I thought that was just too stressful for me. So I didn't enjoy it very much. So I tried to find an alternative for myself. I looked in libraries, I looked for different sources of information and interesting. I wanted something to blow my mind, like the fairy tales of a long time ago. So I discovered something that truly, truly was stunning and shocking, and it blew my mind. It was awe-inspiring. That was science fiction. When I discovered science fiction, I couldn't stop. I read everything I could get my hands on. I mainly read uh, Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke both fiction and non-fiction books, and I was transformed into a totally different world, and I just couldn't stop. And it, it, th th those kinds of stories and books and ideas inspired me to go into a science career, which I did, and I enjoyed every minute of it, and I still enjoy learning about our natural world, and uh, science for me is a passion and I'd like to pass that passion, that love of the natural world and how it works to you so that you can perhaps appreciate it and use it in your lives. Whether you go into a science career or not, you will find that it will help you with your life. So I'm speaking about the universe, but uh, before we start talking about um, you know, some of the surprises in our universe, I'd like to give you, uh, provoke you with this idea. What if I told you that you can volunteer, so it'll be completely free of charge, to go on a spaceship like this, very round, and uh, this spaceship will take you on a trip around the sun and back in one year. This spaceship will go very fast. It's about 108,000 kilometers an hour. Very fast. And it will also spin as it goes. It will spin like this. Okay? And it, it, sometimes it tilts. As you can see in this picture, it's tilted. But this spaceship has no pilots. No navigation, no navigation team. We're completely on our own as passengers. When we go on this ship, it has an autopilot that goes by itself. And it has no spare parts. If something goes wrong, we're in trouble. So I ask people, would you go on a trip like that? Would you take a trip? Would you volunteer? Many people would say no. What do you think? Think about it. Would you go? You know, here's a shocking fact. Are you ready for this? Actually, 
you are already on a spaceship like that going around the Sun because this is home this is planet Earth this is where we live and we are actually going around the Sun once every year at the speed of 108,000 kilometers an hour and the Earth is also spinning going around its axis rotating at 1,600 kilometers an hour Earth doesn't have spare parts if something goes wrong if we break it we're in trouble we will all die and um, and Earth also doesn't have a pilot it just goes by itself so we are already on a trip like that and to me this is a very uh, awakening fact a lot of people don't think of it that way but it's true and if you go out of the city on a dark night when there is no moon you'll be able to see this spectacular view this is part of our Milky Way galaxy and uh, our Milky Way is a galaxy that has 200 billion stars and we are just part of that galaxy we are just one single star out of 200 billion others in this galaxy that we call the Milky Way so what is the universe when I say universe what do what do I really mean exactly okay well let's let's see if we can understand that together let's start in your room so you are in your room you're playing you're having fun but your room is only one out of so many other rooms in your house your house is just one out of so many other houses in the street in the neighborhood well your neighborhood or your street is just one out of so many in your city or town or village wherever you live and but this is also part of a country your country has hundreds if not thousands of villages and towns and cities right so your country is just one out of so many countries in on planet earth planet earth is uh, is a big sphere that has mostly ocean but also has a lot of land and your country is just one out of those countries in, on land is that the universe no of course not the universe is much bigger than that well look planet earth is only one out of eight planets in our solar system solar system is composed mainly of the Sun the Sun is 99 percent of the mass of the solar system the rest of the eight planets on rocks and debris and asteroids and comets and everything else it's just uh, all of them together are just about one percent of the mass so is that the universe no of course not its universe is bigger than that our Sun is just a star and one single star out of 200 billion other stars in the Milky Way galaxy so the Milky Way galaxy has about a hundred two hundred billion stars we don't know the exact number it's an estimate maybe a hundred maybe two hundred billion and our Sun is just one little tiny dot among all these stars is that the universe no actually the universe is bigger because there are about 200 billion other galaxies each galaxy has a hundred or 200 billion other stars like ours some smaller some bigger but a lot of stars a lot of galaxies is that the universe well believe it or not all these stars all these galaxies that I'm talking about are only four percent of the re of the universe what's the other 96 percent well <clears throat> we don't know the other 96 percent of the universe is dark matter and dark energy we call it dark matter because it doesn't interact with life so uh, with light so we can't see it and um, so how do we know that how do we know that 96 96 percent of the universe is made of dark matter and dark energy how did we discover this fact and what's the proof for this what's the evidence for that we will talk about that during the episodes one of my favorite scientists Carl Sagan I'd like to quote him he says somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known and how true that is because every day of my life as I read and interact with uh, people and learn I discover incredible 
mind-blowing facts about our universe and, and uh, the, uh, uh, how nature works and, and the natural world that we live in. So uh, I'd like to just, in this introduction, give you a taste of some of these surprises and or stunning or amazing facts about our universe. All right, so ready for some surprises? Let's start. Okay, here's one. A butterfly is a tiny insect. It goes to the flower and it sucks the nectar and from that nectar it gets all the energy that it needs to live. While it's doing that, the flower has pollen and the pollen are you know, the children, the babies of the plant, okay? It's actually more than that, but in this introduction, I want to simplify things for you. So as the butterfly is taking the nectar from the flower, some of that pollen sticks on its body parts. And when it goes to another flower, the pollen goes to another flower, and that's how the plant spreads and, and makes itself uh, copies of itself and spreads around and from one field to another field and from one plant to another plant. This relationship between the butterfly and the plant is an example of what we call symbiosis. Symbiosis means, sim means together and biosis means life, so that means living together. The life of the plant depends on the butterfly and the life of the butterfly depends on the plant. So that's an amazing relationship. But you know what's really more amazing than, than, than the symbiotic relationship between them? What goes on inside the cells of the butterfly and the structure of the cells of the butterfly and the structure and what goes on inside the cells of the plant are not really that different. They're very, very similar. They look entirely different on the outside, as you can see, but on the inside, they're united. They look very much the same. And we will learn and discover how that works and why this is so um, in, in the coming episode. Here's something else that a lot of people don't really believe or understand, and it's just against logic. If you take a feather, which is very light, and a coin, made of metal coin, which is very heavy compared to the, to the feather, and put them in a jar that has no air, no air at all, just empty jar, we call it vacuum. And let them drop down. You will see that they will reach the ground at the same time. This experiment was done many times. It was even, this experiment was actually done by astronauts on the moon. Why? Why does a, a, a coin, which is so much heavier than the feather, take the same amount of time to reach the ground. It should be faster, right? I mean, your mind thinks oh, well, the feather should, take, should, should go down slower and the coin should go down faster. But they go down at the same rate, at the same speed. They reach the ground at the same rate, same time. Why is that? We will study that in the coming episodes. Here's something else that will blow your mind. 225 or 200 million years ago, 250 million years ago, all the continents that we have today, the seven continents that we have on Earth today, all of them, all of the land masses, masses were joined together in one super continent. We called it Pangaea. Pan, Pan means universal, and Gia means Earth. That means one piece of land, one super continent. And look, uh, where there's a circle there in the middle, the eastern part of North America, probably New York, was next door to the west northern part of Africa, which is what, Mauritania and Morocco. Incredible. They were neighbors. So what happened? How did we get the seven continents out of this one single supercontinent, this Pangaea? How did it break up into seven continents? Well, land started to rip apart. As you can see here, it's just land masses starting to move away from each other. The, 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 there was a rip in the, in the, in the, in the uh, land mass. As, as you can see, these land masses started moving away from each other 
and eventually we got all these seven continents. Here's a closer look. These land masses are breaking apart and moving to form all these continents. Just look at that one piece, you know, in the center on the left, and um, that is India, actually. India was part of uh, a larger, a larger uh, uh, land mass called, uh, in, it joined with Australia and the Antarctica. Antarctica moved south, Australia moved a little bit north, and uh, the Indian subcontinent moved north and collided with the Eurasian continent. Eurasia, we call it because it's Europe and Asia connected together in one landmass. And it jammed or collided in the southern part of Asia and formed what we know today as India. And as a result of that collision, the crust of the earth was pushed up high and it's about 9,000 meters high, 9 kilometers high. And that is what we uh, call the Himalaya mountains. That's how the Himalayan mountains were formed. And you know what? They're still going up. They're still going up about one centimeter every year from 25, 30 million years ago until now. They're still going up. To me, that's, that's a mind-boggling uh, revelation. What powerful forces can rip all these lands apart, rip those continents, and move them across like that. What are these forces? Where do they come from? What is the source? We'll study that. So, uh, here's something else that is fantastic to learn. Our universe is actually getting bigger and bigger in size. It's expanding like a balloon. When you blow a balloon and it expands, the universe is expanding in a similar way which means that the galaxies are actually moving away from each other. Our galaxy, when you look with the telescopes in space, you see that the other galaxies are moving away at high speeds, away from each other. How can that be? What incredible forces are making these huge galaxies, each galaxy with 100 or 200 billion stars, move away from the other galaxies? And how do we know this? What kind of experiments do we perform to find out? How do we know how fast they're going? We will learn about that. And here's something else that is really amazing and mind-boggling. You know, um, the secret of life is in four letters, G, C, A, and T. That's the secret code of life. When I learned that about 40 years ago, I could not stop learning because that was just amazing for me. What do we mean by G, C, A, and T? What, what do they stand for? Well, they stand for um, small chemical compounds called nucleotides. The G is guanine, the C is cytosine, the A is adenine, and the T is thymine. And these four compounds are jointed. We call them monomers, which means small pieces. We, we join them together into a long, long, long chain to make a huge molecule. And this molecule you've already heard of. It's a DNA molecule. So the DNA molecule is made of just these four different kinds of nucleotides, the G, the C, the A, and the T. And that controls all life. Let me explain that a bit more because it's really fascinating. As you know, every living thing has proteins. A tree has protein, an insect has protein, a lizard has protein, my skin has protein, bacterium has protein, virus has protein. Everything has protein as part of their structure. What are these proteins made of? A protein is just a long, long chain of amino acids joined together in one chain. We will learn in more detail about that later. So if you examine these 20 amino acids that, that make up my skin, you'll find that they are the same 20 amino acids that make up the protein of any other uh, living thing, whether it's a virus or bacterium or an insect or a lizard or, or a sequoia tree, any living thing on earth has proteins that are made up of the same amino acids. So what determines, who says which amino acid has to connect with the next one? What type of amino acid will connect with the next amino acid and the next amino acid until you make the long, long chain that we call a protein? That is determined by DNA. 
And that is why DNA is the master molecule of life. That is why GCAT is the secret code of life. And it is represented with this beautiful graphic that shows, you know, how the every three letters, the G, for example, with the U and another U, decides one amino acid. If the G joins up with an A and another A, it'll make a different amino acid, and so on. And so there are 64 different codes that dictate all the 20 different amino acid sequences that we have in all proteins, in all living things, no, no difference. And that is a fantastic revelation. That is a mind-blowing uh, fact. And mind-blowing because how did we discover all this? Who discovered this? One person? No. Thousands of scientists over a period of about 50, 60 years um, that we discovered all this information. And we're, we're still discovering more and more and learning in more detail how this works. So I'd like to, in a few of these episodes, explain about the secret of life and how it works and how DNA controls all the characteristics of life regardless whether if it's very small or very big. Here's another revelation that is amazing. Um, it was discovered that in the bottom of, uh, of the ocean in many places, we have hydrothermal vents. What's a hydrothermal vent? Hydro means water and thermal means heat. That means hot water vents in the bottom of the ocean. Hot water from under beneath the earth where it's very hot, it's actually boiling up and coming from the bottom of the earth all the way into the ocean floor. And it has a lot of hydrogen sulfide and a lot of minerals. But the temperature can be as high as 400 degrees. And yet, in the bottom of the ocean, close to these hydrothermal vents, you'll find living things, especially bacteria and archaea, another kind of tiny organisms that we can't see with our naked eye, you need a microscope, similar to bacteria, but they're called the archaea. And they live in those places. How can a bacterium survive with these high temperatures? And what are the forces that are bringing forth all this hydrogen sulfide and hot water from below the earth into the ocean? We will learn more about that. And here's something else that's uh, fascinating for me. Um, our Earth is about 12,500, 12,300 kilometers in diameter, width wide, like that. Which means, from this chair where I'm sitting, if you go straight down to the center of the Earth, it's about 6,300, 6,500 kilometers. And there is where we have a hot core, solid but hot, part of our earth which we call the core. It's made of iron and nickel, mostly. And you know, it is 7,000 degrees Celsius. 7,000 degrees. The surface of the sun is 5,500 degrees Celsius. How can the center of planet earth be more hot than the surface of the sun? What, what, what's the source of all this heat? Where does it come from? And is it going away? And uh, how come we don't feel it? Sitting up here, normal temperature, comfortable. So we will explain and explore a lot of these amazing things in the coming episodes. And here's something that is fascinating for me. Carbon. You know, if you take charcoal, charcoal that you use for, for your barbecue, that's carbon. You know, carbon is a small atom actually, not very big. And it can join with other carbon atoms to form a lattice in the form of a tube, a very, very small size tube. But this tube is extremely strong. It is in fact a hundred times more strong than steel. And why do we call it nano tube? Because nano means nine, because the size of that tube is measured in nanometers. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. If you take a meter is made, each meter is made of 
100 centimeters and 1,000 millimeters and 1 million micrometers and 1,000 million or a billion nanometers. And so these carbon tubes are actually made so uh, they are so small in size that we call them nanotubes. So, um, in fact, I'll tell you how small they are. If you take uh, one of your hairs, uh, I don't have much hair, but if you take one of my hairs, you can fit about 10,000 of these nanotubes inside one human hair. That's how small it is. And yet, it's 100 times stronger than, than steel, and it's elastic. You can stretch it like a rubber band, and it conducts electricity and conducts heat. And it's not as dense as steel. It's, I think, one-fourth as, as dense as steel is. So it's, uh, it's fascinating how nature sometimes surprises us with things like that.